Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, writer, director, producer, the amazing Paul Faith. Jason Statham, they don't always like first time laughing when they hear that. But then, you know, he just, he, he, 
was so great. He, he was a little nervous when he took the role because he was, you know, he's really making fun of his bread and butter persona. <laughs> but I was like, just, just come, come along with the ride. I'm telling you, we will give you such silly things to say. Just don't be funny. Just play it straight. And he had the best time. He was really, he's a delightful, delightful man. I do agree. I love the fact this is a really a spy movie. It's not a parody. And even you know, from the opening sequence and the, and the James Bond sort of, you know, and there's this that sort of, was that an homage to James Bond films? I mean, the opening sequence? Yeah, I mean, you know, I just like, you know, more than anything, I like the way Bond films start because, you know, like, I like, I would say, like, I want a movie to be shot out of a cannon. Like, so what can we have just right in front of the thing, you know, like, right away, like, right with sex scene, you know, whatever it is. Because, you know, you want to grab people, I, and, and movies do kind of tend to, you have to set up so much stuff, and if you give something like, you give the audience something big up front, it's fun, but you can also even get them some of the characters. You know, it really shows their relationship. But then, you know, for the opening credits sequence, I wanted to make sure, like, you know, that's an original song written by our composer, produced by this amazing singer called Ivy LeVan, who, uh, the, the, the long, the full-length version of that song is coming out, she's actually shooting a video for it right now, and it's one of the most amazing songs, full-length you've ever heard. Uh, so that'll be out soon. <laughs> That's great. They actually sent us a song, so we're going to be playing the party. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, okay. Okay. <laughs> so you can hear it. Check out Ivy Lohan. She's, she's the next big thing. So you said you lo love working with funny women, and you, most of your films have these amazing women characters. Was there a formative experience that led you to the fact that you revolve everything you do in terms of your films? Around strong women characters, or is it that you know, is your wife, or what is it? I mean, it's just I grew up. I was an only child. I grew up. Never mind. Uh, but I was an only child. I grew up. Uh, but I grew up next to a family of eight kids, and six of them were girls, and so they were my friends. And so I always hang with them. And then in school, I was, I was, believe it or not, I was bullied a lot. <laughs> I'm so cool. Uh, and so, you know, I had guy friends, but all our friends, it was like, it was like the table of freaks and geeks, you know, we were just kind of like a little group of kind of weirdos. But then all the regular guys were like, so aggressive and name calling and punching and, you know, the locker room was a disaster, you know, just a place to get killed every day. And so I would always just like run to the, all my girlfriends, quote unquote, and just, and I had so much fun because, they were always so, we just made each other laugh all the time. And it wasn't like an aggression to it. It was just kind of like being silly and having fun and, and all that. And just throughout my life, I always hung out with funny women. And, and that because of that, I got to know, when I was a stand-up in, in the business, all these funny actresses, comedians. And so I'd go and see movies, you know, with all the you know, funny guys in it and stuff. And they go like, oh, there's, you know, there's somebody, a funny woman I know. And then she's not funny at all. Like, like she's reduced to being like a shrew or being like a mean girlfriend or like a bitchy wife, you know. And, and I was like, well, that's not fair. Why, did, why can't they be funny? It was so upsetting to keep seeing these funny women not being funny. <laughs> and so it was just like, it just became like, in my brain always, I just think of female characters. I mean, in Freaks and Geeks, my favorite character was Lindsay. That was the one I just, I loved to write. Because to me, you know, she was a 16-year-old girl and I was, 35 year old man, and basically we were in the same maturity level. <laughs> I just channeled all my angst through her. And then, I, but I would always try to pitch female projects, movie projects, and would always be told immediately by the business producer, studio, whatever, like, oh no, I can't do woman as we can. And in the beginning, it kind of went, oh, well, I guess they know because they don't show up as my own. It just it was a number of years ago, like, oh, wait, why can't I be a woman? It, and they would always have these, let's see, Internationally, you can't sell a movie with a woman in it because all these countries won't go to see a movie with a woman in it, this and that. So I, I started to like, well, why are we accepting that? Why, why should that be the rule? And so honestly, this thing, I mean, one of the, one of the goals with, with Spy was to create a movie starring women that has so much action and so much stuff that can just, so guys don't see men or women, they go like, oh, look, all that kick ass stuff. And so the real goal of this, I mean, obviously we wanted to do well domestically just to keep, you know, keep Hollywood out of track that we started women, people actually go see them, is internationally, if we can get an international audience to show up, it's gonna be a big deal because, I mean, the, 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 one of the biggest stories, I think, from last year that never got, talked about is how the movie Lucy, how well that movie did internationally. That was a big, big deal. And nobody made a big deal, no 
nobody talked about that because that was like one of the first times a movie starring a woman did huge, did really well internationally. And so that's my hope. Also, because I'm also told that you know you just hear all the time American comedy doesn't work internationally. So this is just I'm really if movie making, and this is you know this is the gross Hollywood side of things. But movie making has become so much about the international market now that that will rule these decisions. And so. Again, I want to get ahead of that thing, so they, it's very easy for them to go, like, oh, we can't star women and stuff because of that. If we can break that down, everybody, all the filmmakers here, just keep thinking about that. Try, try to figure out a way to just make movies that are compelling in a way that they will play internationally. And who knows what the formula is, but you know, if you tell great stories, Bridesmaids really did really well internationally. So if we can just break that down, like, just don't accept these stock bullshit answers anymore. They just keep saying that. And saying that. So I want to ask you about Greeks and Meat, but first I want to ask you about Ghostbusters. I, I read that the, that came to you while you were working on Spy, and, and can you talk a little bit about that? And that's another you know, female-driven movie. Yeah, I mean, it was. I had been contacted throughout when I was making Spy by by Sony and by Ivan Reitman because they had this sequel script they wanted to make, and uh, I, was, I love Ghostbusters. But I, kept, I don't know. I, I don't want to make a sequel because. Bill doesn't want to do it, and Harold Ramis had just died, and I was friends with Harold, and, and, and you know, and so was Dan and Ernie, you know, which it got less of. But it's kind of like, oh, how do I make a sequel of that? And the scripts were good, but they always felt kind of sweaty. You know, I mean, I, so I was like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it because I don't want to take that on unless I can really nail it. But they just kept, kind of kept bringing it to me, and I was like, God, it's such a great idea. The Ghostbusters idea is such a great idea, and this cool franchise is sitting there. And so just one day I was like, well, how would I do it? It's like, well, wait, if they're all women, that would be really fun. And I, then I know how to do that. And I thought, well, then let's just make it a reboot. Just kind of reset everything and go into a world where there are no ghosts and where it's our world where we haven't had big events, big paranormal events already. I thought, that I know how to do. And, and, and Sony, you know, they got for Sony, and, and, and Amy Pascal, who was very unfairly taken out, if you want to call sexism on that, please do, because I don't think it would have happened to a male. Studio had to get knocked out because of some shitty emails that they wrote. But um, she was the one that basically came in and said, you know, and, and grabbed it and took it, and that we, um, and that we, uh, you know, kind of went forward with it. And so now we have this amazing cast, and we're going to start shooting a, literally a month from tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so a little bit about Freaks and Geeks in terms of this film. What does it do? Step back in time. It's a frequent geek on the television that got canceled really too soon, and now it was a modern classic. And there's so many actors that were in it that were unknown, and now have gone on to other things. What, um, I mean, and you did that with Judd Apatow. So what, what was that, what was that like in terms of, what, did you actually get, get a sense when you were making that it was really resonating with fans, or? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you never make something and go like, oh, it's very, you know, we were really happy with it, and I was, I was so deluded, like, Everyone's going to love this show. Like, how could this show not be a hit? And it was just, it was too, at the time, it was too much for most audiences to take because people just going, oh, I can't watch that show. It's too painful, too painful. I thought, I said, I had so much fun reliving and telling stories, like sh terrible stories from the past. You know, that was when we had the biggest laughs when I would sit around with my friends and stuff and go like, well, everybody must love recounting these things. And then you find out most people don't want to remember the shitty side of their life. <laughs> and so it's like, boy, this was a major miscalculation on my behalf. <laughs> but, you know, it, it just, I just wanted to be this honest thing that told the story. You know, I, I had seen so many high school movies and TV shows. I was always about like, good looking kids and they're all dating and they're having sex and they're so together. And it's like, how does that, we couldn't fathom holding a girl's hand at that point. You know, so, so it just became just like a purely one something that felt real to my experience in school. So recently also, uh, Mystery Science Theater and Joel Hodgson, and what, um, you know, he goes to other space and he's done a few projects with you, so what, is, what kind of influence has he been on your career? Oh, God, well, I mean, I am the world's biggest Mystery Science Theater fan. Uh, thank you, yes, exactly. And so I actually just became, I befriended Joel because I, I became friends with, with uh, 
with J. Elvis Weinstein, who was the original voice of Tom Servo for you hardcore MSP nerds. And uh, so I, he moved out to California, I became friends with him, and through him, to Angle, to become friends with Joel, and kind of stalked Joel, and then became friends with Joel, we became really close friends. And then when I was doing Freaks and Geeks, I said, Joel, you gotta come on. And he was like, all we do is like a word of And so, and so he works at the disco, he's the disco salesman in Freaks and Geeks. And now, now we have him on the, on my Yahoo show called Other Space. So if you got a chance, go to Yahoo Screen. Just show, nobody knows the Yahoo Who Screen that exists, but I have eight episodes of this really fun sci fi comedy, uh, half hour comedy. So, so you can just watch it online, right? You watch it online, it's free. It's absolutely free. Yahoo Screen. So, so, so uh, one last project I'm asking that's good. I've read that's great. That's a penis movie. Can you tell us? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Or I, no, yeah, I'm, producing, I'm producing the penis movie, which comes out in November. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very sweet. I mean, very, you see, I do. I, I like to do R-rated comedy, so it's very. There was a lot of swearing in this movie. There is a lot of swearing in this movie. I don't know what my problem is. I just <laughs> it makes me laugh. I don't know why. It, but it's very specific. You have to find people who can swear. It, it's amazing how few people can swear in a way that doesn't make you go, like, oh, "That's really ugly." And Melissa and Rose who just unleash a man. They just kind of, they just roll along like poetry. I don't know. <laughs> It's funny, on our other space show, we have this great young cast that they would swear occasionally. And instead, we, we, on Yahoo, we can say whatever we want, but I made the decision I was going to bleep all their swearing because weirdly it didn't sound as fun to anybody. It sounded kind of harsh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a swearing aficionado, I might say. But so it's ironic because now I'm doing Peanuts, which is the most G rated movie you've ever seen in your life. But it, it's really sweet. I mean, I grew up in Peanuts, it was my favorite thing in the world. I knew all the comics, and so it was just, I kind of came out of more to trying to guard the tone, which I didn't have to because the fan was old. There's the outtakes of swearing in it. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. The gag <laughs> rate. <laughs> and uh, what about, I mean, like, would you ever go back to stand in comedy since 2000 or is that sort of in the past? No, ironically, Judd at the Avatar is going back to doing stand up. He's doing it all the time now and he's really good at it. I, I, I have too much fun helping more talented people be, <laughs> be their best and be kind of stay behind the scenes. Like, except, unless I'm the drunk man running, running into a wall in the hallway. <laughs> that was really fun. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I haven't studied hard to summon what it's like to be that drunk and walking into a wall. <laughs> I'm very mad. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, ironically, any, any filmmakers here, the greatest thing I for my filmmaking career was being a stand-up comic because the way that I put my movies together is exactly the way I used to put my stand-up act together, which is we get on the set, we shoot, we shoot all kinds of stuff, we shoot a million different jokes, we improvise, I've got writers, I'm one of the things, and the cast one of the things. So each scene we have a ton of stuff. And then when we go back to the editing room, I just start a few weeks into my director's cut, we'll just do screening. And we'll recruit like an audience of 500 people we don't know and uh, show it or the laughs, and then go, okay, that didn't work, that worked, that didn't work, and go in and, you know, and put a bunch of new jokes in and try it a few weeks later. And we do that like nine or ten times over the course of several months, which is exactly when you build a stand-up act. So by the end, we know that the laughs work for most audiences. You'll still hit people that you know, audiences that will feel kind of the rocks on, but, but it's, it's, it's the same reason why uh, you can call, the media can call an election 1.1% 1. 1 of the precincts have already done, because like, an audience of 500 people is pretty representative, no matter where you are. That's what's really cool. And so, you know, when you're making a studio comedy, well, it's not the way you can make, make an independent film that way, but I'm making this studio comedy that has to play for the biggest amount of audiences that it can. So I do have to be kind of you know, doing the research to do that. Plus, I, I, love, I love testing out jokes and going, like, let me talk about Let's make that funny. Well, it'll definitely work for 3,000 people tonight. Um, I I think it's with comedy, you know, you, you use it in a way to tell very, very serious things, but you know, but it's more enjoyable that way. But would you ever, if you have a serious thing, would you ever make something that's not a comedy? Or do you have that uh, in, in you yeah, I made I made a I made a drama back in 2002 called I Am David, which none of you saw. Um, <laughs> you know what? To me, comedy is drama. Uh, comedy is the most effective way to tell any story. And comedy gets a bad name because comedy 
has been done so poorly over time and because people put the joke about all else. And if you go in and go like, put the characters, the story about all else, the jokes will fall into place. We hire funny people, we have, you know, then it will happen. But but I I don't, I don't know, I don't have any, it was not fun for me when I did drama to go to a screening and sit there and like, oh, are people enjoying this? Like, when you're laughing and then you're kind of getting into a character and you're, you're just feeling something, you're getting like an emotional response. To me, comedy's the greatest way to do that. And again, you know, you don't face it like, you know, just pie in the face. And that, that you, can't, you can't do that. You just go joke to joke if, you're, if you don't have characters you care about, if you don't have real emotions roiling under it. I mean, whenever we write, I write a script, it's always, treat it, first draft, I feel like a drama. Like, make sure all the underpinnings of this work, and then we start putting the jokes in time. And then we start finding out how to other we do this, but I love comedy, and, and I, I wish comedy got more respect. It, it's great; audiences love it. And, uh, you know, when you do it well, and, and, but I have no desire to not make an audience laugh ever again. <laughs> well, I just want to end by saying it's an honor. It, it was an honor to have your film as our opening night yeah, film, the Seattle Film Festival. Thank you so much for bringing it here, and I, I'm sure it's going to be a big success. So, wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.